Well, good morning, everyone. Hi, Kat. Hi, Ron. Good morning. We have Larry Siegel with us this morning, and we're so excited. Wait until you hear what Larry is going to share with us today. But I think, Ron, you wanted to do a little introduction. Yeah. So uh, welcome, everyone. This is our 13th, and it's uh, definitely our lucky show on our previous oh, show. Yeah. <laughs> We're lucky to have you, Larry. <laughs> so our previous 12 shows have been pretty much educating baby boomers and warning them that uh, it looks like most of them are taking way too much investment risk. So it's been a very serious dozen shows. This one is going to be much lighter and uh, really speak to why we're all pretty lucky we weren't born when our grandparents were born. Yeah. So a lot of good things have happened uh, the last two generations. Larry Siegel is someone I've known for 35 years. I uh, used to work uh, originally one of the founders of Ibison Associates uh, that was bought by Morningstar. Then we worked for the Ford Foundation. And uh, Larry, you've been out on your own for quite a while, but you are an amazing researcher. Your book is oh, um, you. just filled with articles that other people have written and, and, and names and, and most importantly, a, a, a really revealing look at uh, where we've been and uh, where, we're, where the human race is going. So uh, we've talked about some cool facts you want to talk to us about, and we'll, we'll turn it over to you. So welcome, Larry. Welcome. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and uh, that's quite a buildup. I am flattered, but I'm a modest guy, so I decided to write a book about the future of the human race. Yeah, that's really <laughs> modest. Yeah, And yeah. Uh, we'll see if it works out this way. The basic theme before I get into the slides, is uh, called Fewer, Richer, Greener. And that is the title of my book, which, sorry for the commercial, but you can buy it on That's Amazon it. just by typing in the words fewer, richer, greener. And there, there is the, the beautiful cover that, I, that Wiley made for me, people stargazing into outer space. The, the population experience. Oh, we lost you. You're, you're, uh, you turned your, um, your, 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 I'm sorry about that. I, That's I okay. Didn't, didn't do it intentionally. Um, so just so you didn't know this folks, we're doing this live. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are indeed. I am, I am still alive. Which yeah. There you go. Pretty good for a baby boomer. Yeah. And, that's in the book too. So it's all good. Yes. If I were born in 1854 instead of 1954, statistically, I would be dead by now because my life back would have been the same as that dog. Now, actually, it would have been about 50 to 55 years, and, and I'm older than that. There you go. So I uh, believe that we've all had the idea drummed into us since childhood that the population explosion is going to, result in a world with barely standing room for all the people in it. And of course, there won't be anything to eat. We've gone from that to a point where the population explosion is basically over. And the biggest problem is obesity, not starvation, although the food isn't distributed evenly and, and some people don't have enough to eat. It's not very many. Uh, could you show the first uh, slide, please? Uh, the one after that. that That's just a tree. Okay. Uh, the green countries, the United States, Canada, Russia, China, Australia, and all of, all, almost all of Europe, the blue countries and the light green countries are the ones where the population explosion is essentially over. The, 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 the light blue are losing population. They, the, I'm sorry, the dark blue are losing population. The green are stable and the light green are growing but slowly in, in a way that they, their population is going to reach a peak including as you see India uh, in in the next couple of decades so the only area of the world where there's still a population explosion is Central Africa sub-saharan Central Africa and even there uh, the, the population growth rates have come down tremendously so the, the world population will peak between 9 and 11 billion later in this century. Then it's going to start to come down. So everything you learned as a kid in school about the 
the, the world being uh, re ready to self-immolate because of too many people is, is now wrong. It, it wasn't wrong at the time. If we continued along that trend, uh, we'd uh, have had a much more serious problem than we do now. But, but in now in many of these places, the problem is too many old people and that will fix itself. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Not too many young people. Yeah. Um, so, so it's just Thomas Malthus, right, Larry, who sort of planted the seeds of overpopulating the world and running out of food. And well, planting the seeds of overpopulating the world makes it sound as though he did it himself. No, no, no I'm just not talking. He put out the idea that that was going to happen. He planted the idea that the population of any species tends to increase until the resources are not sufficient to sustain the species. And then there's a mass die-off of some kind, and you start the same cycle again. We, however, are not lemmings or lemurs, and we make our decisions about how many children to have based on a kind of unconscious cost-benefit analysis that people do. If you need a lot of kids to work on the farm and, and then to support your, your old age, you're going to have a lot of kids. And my, my grandfather was one of eight. Uh, my wife, Connie's father was one of 15 Whoa. and uh good catholics they were not catholic and my grandfather was jewish but they needed a lot of kids to work on the farm and uh so we can see where catholics got that ethic from it, it's not uh it, it's not just religion the religion has a purpose but uh my parents had one me and Connie's parents had two, and this is the trend all over the world in surprising places, Thailand, Mexico, India, Brazil, Iran. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing how uh, countries that are not fully developed countries have very stable populations at this point. So fewer, richer. What is richer? Well, uh, the, uh, the world obviously has been getting rich, richer, but let's just take a look. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? There, you're talking in your book about rabbits versus elephants, and then you call it uh, K something, I think, or Q something. Yeah, R selection and K selection. R selection, R selection is where you have as many children as you can, put limited amounts of investment in them, and expect a few of them to survive to adulthood. If you are a rabbit, that's a good strategy. First of all, they're physically capable of having a lot of babies very fast. Secondly, the, they, they get eaten by hawks and uh, dogs and that kind of thing. Case selection is what elephants do. They have one baby at a time. You can imagine why. <laughs> Takes a while. Takes a while, and a, a baby elephant is a very large baby. And they put a huge investment into each baby and make really sure that the baby survives to adulthood and reproductive age. And that's what we're doing now increasingly in the human race. The kids give you, instead of extra hands on the farm, they give you huge, huge bills for a college education. Uh, they do absolutely nothing for you. They don't write, they don't call. And <laughs> that they, the likelihood that they will support you in your old age is although well, not zero, it's pretty small. Yeah. It, so what you're having, you're having children almost as a favor to the future and a consumer good, because they're you know they're uh, you feel like you're giving back something to society, and that is the direction the whole human race is moving at various different rates from the rabbit strategy to the elephant strategy. Okay. Now, I, to, to show how we've gotten richer, I could put a, up a chart of GNP or incomes, but I decided to put the cost of lighting your room for an hour. And this goes from the year 1300 to, to now. And from 1300 to about 1750 to 1800, the, the cost fell very slowly as new energy sources were discovered, such as whales. You, you could 
if you kill the whale, the whale oil would be oil for a lamb. It's a whale is a very hard thing to catch and then kill and then render into oil and the various other things you get out of whales, such as food. But starting at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, just a little before 1800, the price fell off a cliff. What happened? Well, first of all, we discovered fossil fuels, natural gas, oil, and so forth that are much cheaper than whales and much easier than growing a plant, uh, say a tree burning the wood for light is extraordinarily inefficient. Uh, and then the light bulb, the first light bulb was not Edison. It was a carbon arc lamp invented by Humphrey Davy in 1802, but it was again, horribly inefficient, but it, it beats going out into the ocean to try to catch a whale. And over time, before Edison, uh, carbon arc lamps were the primary source of electric light. After that, it just fell even faster as the light bulbs got better. The sources of energy got cheaper. Nuclear kicked in. And now we've got LEDs and other light bulbs that use a fraction of the electricity that the Edison light bulb, which is the one pictured uh, on the page, uses. And so it, these are factors of 10, each gray line. It, as, as the price falls across each gray line, that's 10 a uh, factor of 10 cheaper. So since 1800, lighting has gotten about 10,000 times cheaper. Wow. You can get 10,000 times as much light for the same amount of labor effort as you did then. It's, it's amazing that Abraham Lincoln, bought, who, who was uh, born in 1809, uh, became a lawyer at all because you have to do a lot of reading and you have to do it at night after uh, a hard day's work of rail splitting, I believe, is what he did. Oh, wow. so a long way. So yeah. you're saying in your book too, Larry, that nuclear is, I want to say, the most efficient and probably the the energy source of the future. Is that a fair statement? or It is if we let it. Uh, nuclear power is a solution that at least we have. We don't have to do more scientific research to figure out what the next innovation is. So we've been using it for 60 or 70 years. And it, it, in the past, it hasn't been particularly safe. Uh, but if we use a lot of small nuclear plants that are have interchangeable designs and parts so that the nuclear engineers can run from one site to another if there's a problem like they do in France, and if we build in safety mechanisms that we already know how to do, uh, instead of using uh, 40, 50, 60 year old plants, uh, it will uh, become the dominant energy source in the future because fossil fuels uh, not only contribute to global warming, at least that's what most people believe, but uh, we're also running out of them. So the, we, we need to know what the next energy source is and it's right under our noses. It's, it's nuclear fission power, not fusion. Gotcha. So we have a nuclear plant that's been closed down here, San mm -hmm. Onofre. Yeah. And um, you can do a tour there, and it's really fascinating. But they pretty much explain how the political powers that be were just so afraid and not interested in getting educated about um, what the problem really was and why it was corrected. So I think there's a lot of fear here that it's going to make nuclear a little harder. It's going to make it very hard, and it's uh, the, the talk that you heard is exactly uh, what's going on. Uh, people don't have a clue uh, about the efficiency and safety of nuclear power. Uh, they hear about Three Mile Island, where nobody died. And they hear about Fukushima, where one person died directly. Other people died in, because of the tsunami that, that caused the uh, accident to become much more severe. And uh, then Chernobyl was a true disaster because the Soviets in the last stages of the, uh, of the dissolution of the Soviet empire ma made no attempt to control it, the damage and told people that there was no damage. And, and so they, they, they uh, exposed themselves uh, at, the government, at the government's insistence uh, to, to a lot of radiation and it was terrible. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully the Soviet Union isn't coming back and, and we won't do that again. 
<laughs> Sounds good. In the meantime, we have nuclear submarines who seem to be running just fine. And mm -hmm. so I think there's demonstrated proof that it can be safe and reliable. So, right. And France has 60 oh. nuclear reactors and has never had an accident. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Of Thank course, you. they're drinking a lot of wine while they're running it. <laughs> it's, it's all good. <laughs> so fewer, richer, greener. What on earth could I be thinking? We, we know that we're destroying the planet and that it won't be here. Actually, it'll be here. It's us that we, we need to worry about. The planet doesn't care about us. But in fact, as we get richer, we're able to afford, and we do afford, much more environmental quality. The, the United States brought in the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act around 1970 when we got to a threshold of about $25,000 a year in today's money of, of, uh, of national income. China's doing it at less than that, 18,000 is where they are, but it, they, they've been at it for a while. Uh, their environment is really quite dirty, and that's what happens when a, a society is industrializing quickly, but then the, you get enough money in circulation, tax money and, and, and other sources of, of, of wealth, that enable people to uh, insist on and get a cleaner environment, and and India, of course, has a way to go. Uh, it's about it's at about seven thousand dollars a year, and when it gets to the range of twelve to sixteen, you're going to see a huge improvement, and wow. that because because at that point uh, people can sacrifice their uh, current current consumption. I'll shed a little light on me here to. Uh, uh, make an investment in the environment, which is, you know, people do want to breathe and they want to drink clean water, but it's not just that. It's other aspects, national parks, which the United States uh, brought in as uh, our own original contribution to the world, right at about the time we became a first world country. Uh, President Grant started the first one right after the Civil War, and then by Teddy Roosevelt's administration in the 30 years later uh, he, he instituted the whole national park system which was very large and, and and very expensive we were able to afford it at that time and there was tremendous popular support for environmentalism and and this will continue as other countries get richer and they they follow our path if you go to the richest country in the richest large country in the world which is either norway or switzerland both of them look like a national park. And there's a reason for that, which is that they've achieved a level of economic development that supports that kind of effort. Cool. Great. Well, why don't we take a look at the next slide here? If you want to know where the economy is going to prosper, you can look back in history and see where there were green shoots of prosperity as far back as, as you care to go. Th this is a very odd map. It's a map of Western Europe, obviously. The lights are a composite of NASA photographs from space of Europe at night. So you can see London and Paris in the northwest corner, the industrialized part of the Low Countries and the, and the Ruhr Valley in Germany. Uh, there's a cluster in the north of Italy, various other cities you can probably identify, like Rome and Madrid. And those funny little lines connecting them, they're not that easy to see, but the, the, uh, Kathy is pointing at some of the lines are Roman roads, 2,000-year-old roads. Oh. You, you can't see them from space, but I had an artist draw the lines on, and they follow exactly the same paths as economic development did 2,000 years later for natural reasons. The easiest way to transport whatever you produce in Milan, see if I can point to it here, to the ocean, which is the, happens to be the Adriatic, is the closest seaport. You, you could go over the Alps to the to, to, to the Mediterranean, but but schlepping products from Milan over the Alps is not very efficient when you can just sail them down the Po River. 
and that's where the Roman roads were, uh, at, just like in England and Spain. Spain is very far away from Italy, but the Roman roads connect all the way to Lisbon, Portugal, the, the primary trade routes. That, that This is just following the path of least resistance. The, the, famously, the streets of Boston were laid out by cows. Cows are not economists. Oh. And yet, in a sense, they are. <laughs> They're trying to achieve the most for the least effort, and so they found the paths that made it easy to get from, cow, you know, cow factory to, to to cow port or whatever whatever it is cows do. And then the Indians, American Indians, came along and did the same thing in the same routes, and then the, the settlers, colonists, and so forth, and you get modern Boston's bizarre layout because of the natural lay of the land. So if you want to know where the, uh, how the economy is going to develop, uh, you can look at history and, and get a tremendous amount of information out of that. And that's no bull. <laughs> uh, we knew Ren would have to put in some joke. I'm, I'm here to comment. I'm, yeah, exactly. And listen to learn. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, if if we start on cow jokes, oh, no. We're, we're, <laughs> no, no, no. I'll tell you one though. What do you call a cow with two legs? Uh, I don't know, Ron. What do you call a lean, cow? Lean beef. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, when you started showing those uh, lights, I, I know you've seen this North and South Korea. Do mm -hmm. you have any comments on? What we're seeing there. And yeah, North Korea is bad and South Korea is good. Yeah. Um, the the lights in North Korea are non-existent. There's a little dot at Pyongyang. Uh -huh. And the South Korea is lit up like a Christmas tree because yeah. the, it's the most heavily industrialized country in the world. The, uh -huh. the whole country looks like the part of Europe right around Belgium and the Netherlands. And so you can see the difference between a communist country, which produces nothing, and... A, a capitalist country that it seems to have their factories running all night. Amazing. Yeah. What, what was that about two leg, four legs good, two legs bad? No, no. I think cow uh, with a lot of what, do you, what do you call a cow with no legs? Yeah. Uh, yes, Ron. I don't what know. Do you? Ground beef. Ooh. Oh my! Oh, Rod, we're doing a show. I'm sorry. Okay, Larry, this is your next slide. I like it. Let's see it. I can't. It's oh, that's oh. that is that is a white rectangle. Right. That that is that is, symbolizes the flag of the uh, of the a new Arctic Republic, which is going to be founded because the ice is melting and. We're all going to settle the Arctic, and and that's what that's what the flag is going to be. It's also what the settlements are going to look like, and what the people are going to look like. Yeah, and there's white buildings in there too, right? Yeah, yes. uh, that that's right. And and there's white Disney World. There's a little. <laughs> you look close. To I got it. Okay, what is this? It looks like a dragon tree from Socotra, the island in. The Indian Ocean off the coast of Yemen, but it is actually a machine which has been designed to suck up carbon dioxide at a thousand times the rate of a similarly sized actual living tree. And it shows the scale, it's the size of a tree. It's kind of pretty, it looks like a tree. Yeah. And it is a possible way of scrubbing the atmosphere of excess carbon dioxide. Uh, I don't think it's going to be needed, but if it is, we have it in reserve as a potential technology. Uh, m models of it have been built. They work. Uh, right now, they use a lot of resources to build, uh, so and a lot of energy. Where are you going to get the energy? Well, uh, it, if we had nuclear energy, we wouldn't be generating carbon dioxide to power the carbon dioxide eater, but right now we are. But this is what scientists and engineers are doing to try to address the possibility that the 
uh, the global warming problem will become really serious. Enough of these and the problem goes away if reducing CO2 in the atmosphere is the way to solve the problem. We don't know that. It's a guess, but it, it's a pretty good guess. So uh, the Boston Tree Party will be in the uh, in our future. A Boston it's Tree Party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very so good. You would, you would put this near coal plants or things like that where carbon monoxide is being emitted or could it go anywhere or how would that how would that work no the the scr uh, scrubbers that take carbon dioxide out of of co2 intensive admissions emissions i'm sorry uh have a different design they're much more effective and you put them right in the chimney and uh, th this is for ambient co2 which is roughly the same concentration anywhere in the world okay so you just plant them all over the place it's pretty it's actually really yeah very it's actually pretty. very pretty because the yeah. the tree that it was designed to imitate is very pretty people go to socotra for vacation uh, it's the only part of yemen where you can go otherwise hmm. they're in the middle of a very serious war yeah right. okay okay very cool human ingenuity Okay, then ingenuity is the only way that anybody ever gets ahead because yeah. we're already doing things as efficiently as we know how, more or less. Sure. And so in order to have economic growth, we, we have to do something uh, with less effort to produce the same output or the same effort to produce more output. And one example is the, the software we're using as a substitute for going to a meeting in person. Uh, 25 years ago, if we couldn't meet in person, we would just not meet. Or we would yak on the phone. Right, right. It doesn't have sure. a same effect. 75 years before that, you, you wouldn't do anything. Right. Yeah. And, and, and if, you think of it, if you think of it now with the savings that there is when you can do everything virtually because you don't have airfare, you don't have hotel rooms, and you spend maybe two days just to have a one-hour meeting, now you can do it. Yeah, it's very cool. Well, that's it's cool. There is a cost, which is that the serendipitous events that occur when you get a bunch of people together, you see somebody in the hall, in the hall at a conference when, that you didn't even know was there and you hadn't thought about in 15 years, yeah. You have something in common that you wanted to work on and you go get, get, have a cup of coffee and you figure something out. That's not happening. Right. So, yeah, but, yeah. but it, 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 there are trade-offs and everything. Right. Are you a Star Trek fan at all, Larry? Did you... you know, I'm really not. I, okay. I'm, I'm uh, more interested in and when I uh, go to the movies, I, I usually want to uh, watch comedies or dramas, but Gotcha. I think fiction was yeah when I was thirteen or ten or something. I'm just, I'm just thinking some of the things in Star Trek. Are, are, are flat screen TVs were in there and uh, telecommunications and all that. That stuff was. Um, well, I'm for, waiting for beam me at Scott. Yeah, I know. Yeah, a transformer. Well, what about Flash Gordon? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. well we're, this is the future. You know, we're living right. In, right. Uh, a part of it was. Uh, the, the yeah. Dr. McCoy had this thing, he'd just wave over you, and it would uh, cure whatever whatever was was wrong with your body. It was right, uh, right. I could something. use that for about now. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's everything. Anyway, okay, your we, next we're, slide we're, is, we're is the is future. A, your next slide, Larry, is a is a blank page again. Okay, well, that's the Antarctic. Okay. Uh, so the next slide, please. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, along with telecommunications and nuclear power, when we're we have a new phenomenon which is both a blessing and a challenge. the The good news is that you could live to 122, like Jean Louise Calment, the French woman who uh, broke all records for longevity. The bad news is you're going to have to pay for it. And it would be great if you could get somebody else to pay for it instead of you, because it's just impossible to work for 30 or 40 years to sa save enough money to, to live for another 60. Yeah. So my grandfather tried, but he ran out of money in his 90s and 
lived to 103 at, at the expense of, of my parents and me and so forth. But 122 is really out there. However, if an insurance company takes your money, a part of your money, and issues you a contract that uh, is called a deferred annuity that starts paying at, say, let's say age 85 until you die, that's a way of hedging the risk that you're going to live a long time and run out of money. I've been advocating this in my on the financial side of my life for a few years. Nobody's doing it except for a couple of financial planners, one in Milwaukee and an actuarial firm in, uh, in that, that seems to run, be run partly out of San Diego. But um, the deferred annuities are available from insurance companies. And so the, the basic plan is conventional investing to save enough for you to draw down the money so that you don't run out before age 85 when the deferred annuity income kicks in. And the, the rough ratios are 85% in the conventional portfolio to last you to your life expectancy, which I'm calling 85, and then 15% in a deferred annuity or portfolio of different deferred annuities because th there is some default risk that you start to pay at age 85 and then you can never run out of money as long as you live. Uh, this this is uh, a uh, kind of a dream design for retirement planning. It's been criticized on the ground that no one will ever buy a deferred annuity because they can't think about that far in the future and figure that something will turn up. That's the McCauber plan. Now, Ron, I've heard you have your own plan for... <laughs> For, for, for very long-lived people. Can you, you briefly describe that for <coughs> Sure, sorry. I have a cough. It's not the COVID, as far as I know. Right. So we started a mutual fund to manage longevity risk. And uh, the name of it will tip you off to what it does, but it's, it's called the Hemlock Fund. And uh, it's really simple. What you do is when you retire, you give us all your money. And, <laughs> well, it, it's this simple. And then we manage your longevity risk. And the way we do that is you tell us when you want some, and we'll send, send you whatever you want. But when we're down to our last $20, we send you a, a box uh, with uh, some hemlock in it. And that's the way we manage longevity risk. There it's so simple. It's, it's so simple. I, yeah. I wonder why I hadn't thought of it myself. <laughs> now, what are your fees, Ryan? Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's a real bargain. It's it's one and a half percent of the asset. So, and and for the, the so piece over of mind, 50 the, years, you take uh, seventy five percent of the assets, and yes. at, so you, in fact, the plan cannot go on for more than sixty six years and eight months because at that point you have taken all the money for yourself, and that's when you send the cup of hemlock. So. Yeah. So Jean Calment would not have lived quite to 122, but, but very close. Yeah, but we, we think the service is worth, worth every penny of that. So, it, And what are you going to do with the money in 66 and years and eight months, Ron? Well, we're baby boomers, so we need to, we need to live in the you know, high quality of life. So, And you live, you live near the beach, so maybe a Warren Buffett's old yeah. beach house and then a yacht. Well, actually, what we're doing to give back to society is many people don't know this, but we have invested most of our money into seashells. Mm -hmm. oh, God. What are those like yeah. C rated bonds? Or? No, they're, they're, they're seashells and it sort of got out of hand. So, what we've done is we've put those shells on beaches all over the world. Mm -hmm. So, wow. I, I, hope, I hope everybody enjoys them. Well, that's why my feet hurt, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I thought they would be. Oh my tans, God. But <laughs> we're we're going too far. I'm sure here, but <laughs> why don't we look at the last slide because it, it has a note of seriousness, but it's very optimistic. Yeah. Good. Okay. Wait. We've got a question here from Brian. Any thoughts on comeback of? Uh... Oh, Tontines. <laughs> yeah, Tontines. But, that, yeah, I actually, do. I, I, yeah. I think that Tontines are very similar in spirit to annuities, except that instead of the insurance company keeping the money, if you don't uh, survive, that to, to keep it to give to the people who do survive, of course, they don't 
make a big profit. The Tanti, the, the people in the risk pool actually keep the money for themselves, so the last to die gets it all. A, a married couple is a natural tontine. You just simply, you, if you die, your wife gets all the money. If your wife dies, you get all the money. And yet people don't kill their spouses to get the money. So there's a, well, once in a while, maybe they do. <laughs> they probably don't like them anyway. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So it is possible to set up tontines with larger pools, but what you really need to do in order for that to come back is for a large institution uh, to issue them and manage the pools so that nobody knows who else is in the pool and then the, the moral hazard of being in a tontine kind of goes away. It, 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 it's easier. There's an article on tontines, and not an article, but a small book published by the CFA Research Foundation where I'm head of research, by Richard Fulmer, and if you just go to cfainstitute.org and select Research Foundation, you can search for the Tontine booklet or, or small book and, and read about it there. It's a cool idea. Yeah. It keeps coming back. Lorenzo de Tonti, the guy who invented it, was three or 400 years ago, So, uh, it, but it is probably easier for insurance companies to manage annuities than it is Tontine pools. Yeah, somebody's got to run it. Yeah. yeah. Are, are there tontines right now? Do any exist? That you know? I don't know. Okay. They would be sort of private. You would get together with a bunch of people and they'd all throw in your money and make a bet on who's going to live longest. That, that's exactly how it, that, but they became illegal around the oh. turn of the last century because there were some, there were some murders and there was some good, there, there was some good entertainment written about it. The, the movie, The Wrong Box was oh. about tontines. Okay, and there there was another play about ton or, or comedy about tontines. I, I forget what it was called, but gotcha. the, wrong, the wrong box was actually pretty good. I think Peter Sellers who oh. was a, a great, great actor. There's a yeah, he's a great yeah. comedian. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay, so why don't you give me that uh, back? Thanks. Okay, this is a uh, an illustration of different payout paths under a, a combination of conventional investing up to age eighty five and then a deferred annuity payout that starts at 85. Uh, and the 20 there at the bottom means years after retirement, you retire at 65. So the different paths before that uh, have to do with whether the market goes up or down and whether your spending is, uh, uh, is mark to market. If the market goes up a lot, you can spend more and you get actually quite wealthy in the 99th and 95th percentile of market performance, uh, but you, the, you never really get poor unless you hit the first percentile, then your spending falls to $35,000 a year based on a, uh, this is, I believe, a $1 million investment. Yep. Still, $35,000 a year is more than you're getting out of a million dollars worth of treasury bonds, so it, this is a reasonable strategy. But starting at age 85, you can stop worrying because the checks are going to come for $61,824 each year until you expire. And that is why uh, this is a good risk management tool. So and coming back to your percentages, so you put $150,000 into a deferred annuity, is that out of a that's million? That's right. And amazingly, it pays $61,000 a year Yeah, wow. because it's a bargain because most people don't live to collect it. And if you do live to collect it, most people don't collect it for very long because they don't live to a hundred and something. Right. So, so it, it's a very affordable risk management tool as well as being effective. Got it. It's very attractive. Yeah. So uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, well, one we of the things we, we got the last one here. Oh Thank yeah. You. Oh yes. Uh, Africa is uh growing very fast economically. The population is also growing fast, which is a concern. You tend to get economic growth in a part of the world that has population growth because young people are energetic and innovative and so forth, but you also have to feed them and find a place for them to live and create jobs. So these are challenges, but by 2100, using UN forecasts, Africa will uh, be will have close to 4 billion people. I don't believe it. The wow. population, they're, they're 
forecasts are fairly static forecasts. And if you look at the low rather than the median, which is the low forecasts have turned out to be right almost every time, it'll be more like 2.8 to 3.2 billion people. So it's how are we, well, it's a lot of people. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's as many as live in China and India combined and maybe plus Indonesia or something like that. How are they going to be living? Well, Africa will be the richest, it will be the uh, poorest continent, but it will be Thailand poor, not Zambia poor. And how poor is Thailand? Well, incomes are around 12,000 and vary tremendously. There's a lot of inequality. That'll be true in Africa too. But if we go back to the slides, let me just read you a few words of this. Um, Deidre McCloskey, one of the great economic philosophers and, his, and historians, said that genetic diversity in a big and rich Africa, rich by comparison to its own history, it won't be as rich as Europe or the Americas, will yield a crop of geniuses unprecedented in world history. Now, think about it. The, the crop of geniuses in Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries came out of a population of 500 million. This will be out of a population of 3 billion and with a lot of variation, a lot of genetic diversity. In a century or so, the leading scientists and artists in the world will be black. Today, a Mozart in Nigeria follows the plow. A Jane Austen in the Congo spends her illiterate days carrying water and washing clothes, but not in 2100. This the, the age of seriously oppressive poverty is about over. Nine That's good news. Yeah, it is, yeah. Nine percent of the people in the world are in what the World Bank defines as extreme poverty. That number was 40% only 40 years ago. Wow. And, of course, the population now is much bigger. That's great. Yeah. It's a long way. We've come a long way. We're going to come a long way farther. Excellent. Well, one of the things I just want to add here, just because COVID is on everybody's mind, um, I don't want to talk about the disease, but I do want to talk about the uh, interventions. Yeah. And the trillions of dollars that are being um, put into the economy to address it. And I, I, I've read the same stuff you have, Larry, and, and people are going, so we've, we've already put $5 trillion into quantitative easing. We're going to throw another three or four trillion into COVID, but there's no inflation, so it must be okay. We we'll just keep pouring money on this thing. No, it's not okay. You first of all, you can't put money into the economy because you have to get the money out of the economy to put it into the economy. So all you can do is move it around from uh -huh. future taxpayers to current benefit recipients, or from savers to non-saver. All you can do is move it around. Got it. So I, I've written about this. I just want to share this with our audience and you. I think the reason the inflation needle hasn't moved so far is most of that quantitative easing money went into the securities markets. Mm -hmm. And what I say there is we've had inflation, but it's been in stock and bond prices. And the, the bond prices are obvious. So they're, they're, they're actually even targeting yields and keeping them at zero. So I they wouldn't be that way if, if it weren't for the quantitative easing. Oh, that's now, absolutely right. And if you think about inflation this way, it, if you want to guarantee yourself an income from bonds of $100,000 a year, at 5%, you need $2 million in bonds. At 2%, you need $5 million. And at 1%, you need $10 million. Now, that's yeah. inflation. Yes. That's when we look. I agree. It's, it's so... We've been saying to the people on our baby boomer show that this is a really, really tough time to be retired, uh, you know, not having a paycheck and, and wanting to be safe, but uh, finding that you can't, you can't be safe and make any money. And, and that's, this is right. that's why I'm still working and you'll get my bill in the morning. Well, yeah, right. Thanks. Exactly. That's why everybody's still working. Yeah. Right. So corollary to that. Retirement. Yeah, I'm also that. still working because I'd be bored out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Well, I think I, th I think we both don't like golf. So. No, I, 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 do. I, I don't. Okay. I don't like it. I don't like it. This I don't like it either. <laughs> okay. but, but I think 
when you start getting checks in the mail to people who can't buy groceries, that that's going to move the CPI meter. That yeah. people actually use that money, and uh, goods uh, will. You know, so the old story with too, too much. I think that's right. I think good. we will get higher inflation. I've been good. saying that since 2008, and I've been wrong. Me but too. Uh, there, so there's a, yeah. yeah. But it's always a concern, and I have a lot of tips bonds in my own portfolio. We do too. Yeah. 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 How about gold? Sorry, what? Gold? Have you thought? Do are you holding gold at all, or do you? No, I don't. Like okay. gold, I, it's too volatile, and it, there, there's no natural reason for it to be the global monetary standard when every uh, issuer says that gold is irrelevant to, to the way that they uh, set to the way that they set interest rates and prices. Uh, it is a prototype commodity, so is platinum. Uh, so are consumables, you know, uh, uh, pork bellies. Uh, Tastes much better than gold. There you go. When uh, pork bellies are up, pork backs are down, right? Jeez, <laughs> oh, here we go that, again. That's when the whole world turns upside down. That's the way it would be. But yeah. right now, pork bellies are down and <laughs> pork backs are up. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, there there are other commodities that could substitute for gold. Yeah, there are. I would buy a basket of commodities in, you know, in an index fund, actually. Okay, uh, just the most important commodity right now is oil. Okay. I think that until we see a serious move away from fossil fuels, uh, that it's going to continue to be a better inflation hedge than gold. But, but I'm not saying to concentrate. Always diversify. Yeah, got it. Good, good advice. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, this has been a real pleasure, Larry. We, yes, we and, and don't forget you can get Larry's book on Amazon, Fewer, Richer, Greener. And... Um, and if you want to, if yeah, you want to hear my other, see my other thoughts, or hear them, it, Larry Siegel S I E G E L, dot org, and it's Perfect. all there. Hundreds of articles. If you have trouble sleeping, that's the <laughs> cure. There you go. <laughs> oh, that's great! I mean, you, you are just so knowledgeable. I'm, I'm always impressed. Yeah. So, it's Don, been yeah, go ahead, Kathy. I'm sorry. I was just going to say it's been a great pleasure having you on the show, and thanks for the practice and everything we did. Always a lot of laughs. Yeah. Now it's always fun working with you guys, and uh, we'll thanks. see you in uh, in the winter. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Person. So, our next show is going to be on Social Security. I'm pretty sure, and we touched on it in I think our our twelfth episode, but this is going to be really in depth about how to make sure you get everything you're entitled to. So okay. stay tuned. Uh, Ron, I think you wanted to mention this too. Oh, well, we always ask for support. So we, we're on Patreon. Um, you, um, I, I think you can see the website there on Facebook and YouTube. And if you just um, subscribe, like us, um, any support would be much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.